So let's start off. The first characteristic, and these aren't in any particular order, these are just the ones that Tim has written out. The first one is a change in priorities. So when I say that, our, the change in priorities, our first priority when we have complex trauma as a child is safety. We want to do whatever we can to make sure we stay safe. So that can be physical safety. Uh, most of our clients come into the room and they, they do a quick take of who's in the room and if they're safe people. If somebody's over there, they don't know, they're not sure, they'll sit over on this side of the room. It's not just people in treatment centers or whatever. This is in churches too. You know, along the edges, you've got all the people who are just kind of watching with this these kind of beady eyes and any community organization or band concert for your kids, everything. You watch people as they come in and you're going to start learning to pick up some of these little cues. But they come in, they do a quick take of the room, and then they pick their seat, they get to that, so that they can stay safe. And it can be a physical safety, you know, there's fear of fires, fear of whatever, so they have to be near a, an exit, they have to be near a fire exit, anything like that. But it's also emotional safety. So our first priority is emotional safety. We don't want to get hurt because as a child we've been hurt all the time growing up. Hurt, 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 wounded, promises broken, that I feel like I'm nothing, uh, I feel like my parents don't care, I'm not loved, I'm not nurtured, all those things. So as we grow up, our first priority is to stay safe, stay safe emotionally. So what do we do as kids? We start putting up walls, okay? I thought I could trust my parents or one or other of them, and they let me down again and again and again. So I'm going to start building up the world walls because I don't know who I can trust. I don't know if they're going to keep me safe. I don't know anything. So, of course, we've got all these walls built up on around us, and then we go into our adult life and think, why do I not have healthy relationships? It's because you can't have healthy relationships if you don't trust, if you don't allow yourself to feel, because you've been you know, told, you know, smart enough, you can't feel sad, you've got to be just happy. So, so your priority in life as an adult is now, I have to stay safe. This, this is where the 10 seconds come in. If you want to share something, absolutely anything, feel free. If you don't, that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, I just indicated that, yeah, that's me. Okay, so there you go. Yeah, that's you, of course. And again, I just want to reiterate, normies don't feel that way. I didn't know that was I want to be a thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Me too. Don't we? When I grow up. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I know any normies. Yeah, yeah. I don't know a lot, but I know a few. I'm not a normie. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Exactly. But I was not a normie. Okay. This. I think you should say for that one too. Like four normies. <laughs> Their priority would be oh. to, you know, love themselves, love other people, love God. But all of that takes a back seat when our first priority is to not get hurt because now we're only looking out for ourselves. We can't, we can't um, love anybody else. Yeah. Two is shame. Now we're going to talk for an entire day. I think it's on Thursday about shame. So we're going to, uh, just to, to give you a quick overview of it. Uh, we feel shame because we don't feel we're good enough, we don't have a lot of value, we're not lovable, and we continually compare ourselves with others. So if somebody else is good at something, instead of going, oh, I'm, I'm glad they've got a beautiful voice and they're singing, and you know, it's, it's a really wonderful quality, and I enjoy it. Instead, that's the normal response. Our response is, oh, I wish I was as good as that. I'm a loser, I can't even carry a note. Um, you know, so you put a lot of shame on ourselves. So again, relating to this, when we have lots of shame, again, our priorities are going to change. Because now, I can't let people see the real me. Because if they really got to see the real me, they would not like me and they would not accept me. So I have to make sure that every decision I make is to keep myself from feeling that shame. And the one thing that I always do or did was in any argument, and I've related to it before, in any argument I had to win. It didn't matter what I did, what I said, but I could not feel the shame of losing an argument. 
again, normies would go, oh, you're right. Yeah, I could uh, do something differently. To me, if somebody made a point that I was wrong about something, oh, there's no way I'm going to admit it. So I'm going to, I'm going to fight, steal, cheat, to do whatever I need to to make sure that I do not feel that shame. So think about in our, and most of you guys are from church communities, so um, I can do a little bit of that. But think about a person who's got deep, deep wounds as ch uh, children. They've got tons of shame, and they walk into our churches, right? They see this perfect worship team going on. They see uh, perfect people wearing perfect dresses um, in their beautiful, perfect groups. Uh, everybody's happy and laughing. They're having a joyful time. They're praying with each other. Think about how they're going to fit in. Not very well, right? Because they don't feel that they have any right to be there. They are covered in shame, and they can't accept that they'll be accepted ever in that kind of environment. Ten seconds. Tell the truth. 
So what happens is that we lie in order to survive. We don't want to get embarrassed. We don't want to get punished. So we start to lie. And what happens is the reward is I didn't get punished. I didn't get shame. I didn't get in trouble. So it happens again the next time. Oh, I think I'll tell a lie. It's going to save me. It's going to protect me. It's all self-preservation. And the problem is then you start to just lie about everything. And um, the thing that happens is that once we get older and we're in this habit, and it's just a habit when they start off, it's a habit of lying, 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 lying. The problem is now I have to have a file folder in my head. Okay, I told this person this lie, this lie, this lie. I told this person this one, this one, this one. So my life is a little different. I have to act this way to make that lie seem believable. This one. So you go through life and you've got this file folder of all these lies you have to keep track of. Now, we get clients in who actually have breakdowns because they, they, they can't keep it all sorted anymore and they just kind of break. It's like, okay, I don't know how, what, where to go from here. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to be real. I don't know how to stop lying. And they just get into this desperate place where they just don't know how to keep it all together anymore. Mm -hmm. I, uh, when I was drinking, I had a lie diary beside the phone so that I would write down what I was telling people because I would tell people I was doing different things yes. and then I wouldn't remember in the morning what I had told them I, <laughs> yeah. what I was doing. Yeah, there you go. But then exactly. in the morning that didn't make any sense and so I was like, why did I even say that to them? And it was tormenting oh. to live in relationship with people yeah. trying to live a lie that I'm drinking. we do is we wear masks. So wearing masks means that we do whatever we can in order to hide the true me inside. Because, you know, I'm not good enough, so I have to pretend that I'm good enough. I kind of can reinvent myself, and that's kind of an exciting thing. So the example I always use is Facebook. Sometimes it just drives me crazy on Facebook because you go through, you you go through some, and I like going on Facebook. I try to check in about 10 minutes a day. And I go through, and there's the families that have these wonderful vacations, and they're all doing all these things. And they, on Facebook, they look like the perfect family, the perfect couple, and all their children are all lined up in their pretty little whatevers, and they're all going to grad school and getting these great degrees and stuff. And then I happen to know what's actually going underneath and the trauma going on and the angst and the, the children lashing out and, and I, just because of the field we're in, I, I often know what's going on. And then I look at these posts and I say, so that's the standard for what we think is the perfect family and the perfect life. How many people are being duped by this? Probably all of them, right? So then again, when we go back to comparing ourselves, there's no way I can meet up with all those expectations and be as good as all those other people. So we have to put on masks so that we can pretend or feel like possibly we're as good as all these other people. So the, sh the shame makes us wear masks so that we don't have to look at the real us, but we can reinvent ourselves. We can do that quite easily. But when we reinvent ourselves, we disconnect from who we really are. All right, on to page, and you'll notice I put page numbers at the bottom, that was somebody's suggestion, so now we can, we can get through them a little easier. Five, we isolate. We isolate? What's that? We isolate. Yeah, something like that. So A, we can do it geographically. We can move regularly, change friends when life gets a little difficult to hide from. We can reinvent ourselves over and over and over, or we can spend our time alone and just kind of shut out the rest of the world. Um, I told you about, I think I've told you, uh, I said the new name, right? Uh, the new director at our center in, in Winnipeg. Her name is Anita. Uh, love her dearly. Um, but she was one of those people that she moved. 50 times in the 45 years that she was alive, 
mostly with her family getting kicked out of their apartments and had to move somewhere else. But then when she ran away from home at 14 and just lived on the streets, she'd uh, kind of start to build her circle and uh, make her friends. Um, she was engaged like 21 times. It was just that her was addicted to her relationships. But when things started to get rough, and of course she didn't have any of those skills to fix anything and have healthy relationships, she packed up her stuff and moved to a new city. She says she's lived in almost every city in Canada. She just would move and then start over. She would reinvent herself in the way that she thought was going to maybe work this time. But she moved, I think she told me, 52, 51 times in her year. And she's a little old, but she's about my age. Yeah. Or you can isolate emotionally. And that's the person that needs to become invisible. They don't want anyone to notice them. They don't want anyone to see what they're really like. Because if they ever got to know them, they would leave them and never go around them again. So at this point, they have to, because they have to isolate and shut down some of their emotions, they also um, have to pretend that nothing bothers them. They're all good. Everything's fine. So this would be the funny guy. The funny guy who's always... He's always got a quip. If something starts to get a little bit emotional, he's got a funny story to get the subject off of that anything deeper. It becomes very superficial, but there's no way he's going to go into a feeling anything. And number C is the through pseudo intimacy. Uh, e pseudo intimacy. So pseudo being just fake, so fake intimacy. So um, often these kind of people, they, uh, well, I've talked about this, the Cheers bar scene, right? It's a very pseudo intimacy. But there's also the people who go from relationship to relationship. So they jump into this relationship and all those chemicals that are going off in your brain, dopamine and all the other ones, oxytocin. And then, of course, then life sets in and they can't handle it anymore because they can't be truly intimate. It's just a fake pseudo intimacy. So they jump out and move to a new relationship. But the thing is, they usually have somebody lined up before they leave the first one. So they're hopping around from relationship to relationship. Um, but the problem is they don't become attached to anybody. So we've talked a lot about that attachment theory. Uh, you're the expert on it, so we can talk to you about it. But that attachment theory, um, they, there's no way they can attach to anybody. Because that means vulnerability, that means trusting, feeling, talking about things, and they just can't do it. Five, ten seconds. I did this. Yes. That's why I came to Canada. I okay. was isolated geographically. Yeah. I left the country. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm from the U.S. Okay. Yeah. Get away and start fresh. That was really a dumb idea. <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> here I am in a country where I, I'm 22 years old and didn't know anybody. Oh my gosh. No way. Yeah. Well, it's been pretty tough. But it's interesting to see this because I did A, my mm -hmm. sister did C. Oh, okay. Yeah, she yeah. was the string of boyfriends, and yeah. that's why she has three ex-husbands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Sure. All right, let's go to number six, anxiety issues. And we talked about that the other day. We talked a lot about anxiety issues. But um, the point being that we live in a constant state of fear or panic. And the point that I want you to, uh, to note is that as we get older, it gets harder and harder for whatever reason to deal with all that anxiety and uh, fear and things that kind of make us kind of close down and shut down. Uh, it gets harder as we get older. And so then you get people who, they've been able to manage it for, you know, during their kid, kid years and teenagers and early 20s. And then all of a sudden they've got to be all these anxieties coming out in their 30s and their 40s and they don't know where it's coming from and they don't understand. They're just getting worn out. They can't keep up with all the emotional stuff going on and they're, they're realizing the relationships aren't working very well and they're not being able to bond and have healthy relationships and intimacy and stuff and then the anxiety starts to take over. So we won't go into that um, because we've talked a lot about that. Um, just one of the things that come out of anxiety and again as we get older is the sleeping issues. 
you know, we can't sleep as easily. We uh, we have lots of um, we, we feel like we always have to have our back to our front to the door so that we're always watching for the door because of that fear. Uh, we have lots of self-soothing techniques. You know, I used to suck my thumb, did it till I was 12. Um, just lots of things that we do a lot of self-soothing just to help us to be able to sleep and relax, but it's because we have all those anxieties. On to number seven, we manipulate. So as, as children, our needs were not met, so we had to learn how to manipulate mom and dad and our caregivers to give us what we want without having to ask them because they might say no, or they might punish me for having needs. So I have a really, really good example of that one. Um, again, I've talked to, this is a Nina story, but it's just phenomenal, and she's given me permission to use it. Uh, when she was in her uh, 10, 11 years old, uh, her grandfather usually came on the weekends, and he started sexually molesting her. So what she learned was that if she was the best child possible to her mom, she would start cleaning on Mondays and uh, doing things for her mom. Mom, do you want me to cook tonight? Do you want me to run an errand for you? Do you want me to bring you something from uh, the store? And she would just serve be sweet, be as nice to her mom as possible. So that by Thursday night, when she says, Mom, it's okay if I sleep at my friend's overnight, her mom was always happy to say, yes, of course, you've done so great this week. Yes, of course, you can go to your friends for the weekend. She went to her friend's place for the weekend for four years straight and never spent another weekend at home unless she'd been a bad girl and didn't do what her mom said and didn't do the extra chores that her mom wanted or did something that her mom didn't like and her mom wouldn't let her go away for the weekend. So then, of course, she had to spend the weekend in hiding because her grandfather was there for the weekend. So what did she do? She had to learn how to manipulate mom so that when she asked for some of her needs to be met, her mom would be okay with it. She was happy with her and happy to say yes. But to come right out and say anything, she couldn't do that because her mom wasn't a healthy individual. So she had to manipulate her to get her needs met. Eight. Everybody's going to laugh at this on control issues. Who doesn't have control issues? You guys are just kind of quietly marking little check marks on the side just just to give yourself a bit of an idea of which ones kind of resonate with you which ones you can uh, identify to because that will be helpful as you look back on all these notes I always tried to do the manipulating when I was younger but I just couldn't master it you know I, I, would, I, you know, I was I just was bad and, and I, I remember trying to lie a couple of times got caught it's like well, there's no point no. in this <laughs> that's good you tried and it didn't I work. Did, oh. I did, and I wanted to manipulate, but yeah. I just, I, yeah. what a boy. Just weren't good at it. <laughs> <laughs> really bad. Yes? I, I'm looking at the list, and I'm thinking, everyone has at least a bunch of these at some point in life. In some point but in life. That, that was they, a good point. Are they your general, regular traits or not? I mean, that's the question. I think we have to look at where we're at now, and if we have a lot of these traits now, most of our addicts coming in have all 60 or 58. They have them all because their life is not working. It's not working at all. Um, Tim doesn't have any of these. He, he's got none of them. Now, he's very strange, okay? We tell him all the time. He's not the normal person. I get that. And a lot of us have some of these things, but not in the extreme sense where it's causing our life to be in pain. Or causing her life to not work. And some of them are situational. You just yes, yes. Somebody yeah. your job. Yeah. You have more anxiety. Yeah. Let's sleep. And these are patterns. These are patterns. So control issues. If you spend your life trying to control people around you on a regular basis, I mean, yeah, there are situations where you try to make sure it works out okay. I mean, that that's different. We're talking about patterns of life. Yeah. Yeah. Good clarification, though. Yeah. <coughs> Control issues. Um, in a dysfunctional family, our 
authority figure controlled everything we did. And I've shared a little bit about my family. I didn't have control over anything in my life. So um, to help my, to get my needs met, um, I had to start to learn to control other people because I knew I couldn't control my family or authority figures because authority figures to me were scary people. They were ones that were going to abuse their authority and in some way control me and not allow me to be who I was or not allow me to do what I wanted. But I would start to control. I had a twin sister. She happened to be easier to control. So I controlled her. So I think I've got complex trauma. She's got more because I, and I tried to control her. So she had even less rights and less, she knew less about who she was and what her needs were because I controlled her. But if there was any way I could control other people, that gave me that sense of power that, okay, I can make a decision or I can do something. So with authority figures, they, had, they made all the decisions and they had no thought about how it affected you or what you wanted or what you felt. So think about now, even now, how do we respond if someone tells us what to do? Of course. My mom has some yeah. really bad control issues. So the only thing I could control was food. Yes. Down. Yes, that's a big thing. Yeah. That, yeah, that was my. Yeah. yeah. A lot. Actually, I've heard a lot about the food issues, the uh, the bulimia, and the uh, all the other, and cutting too, right? Mm -hmm. My mom's making me do this and this and this, but I can do this. She can't control that. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, um, because we're a Christian family, my mom was always trying to control who we spent time with. Right. You know, the kids were in our neighborhood. You know, those were the easiest ones to play with. Yes. You know, maybe mom didn't like the family. Yes. But it was always, and, and I know that Sometimes I still struggle with a little bit. If I don't, you know, just because they're Christians, I don't really need to like them. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> don't really need yeah. to spend time with them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I still kind of struggle with yeah. that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <coughs> all right. We also have trust issues. Talked about this a lot. Yeah. <coughs> so our parents are supposed to keep us safe. They're supposed to keep their promises. They're supposed to love me unconditionally. But if they don't and our needs are not met over a period of time, we learn very quickly our parents can't be trusted. So again, here's another of Anita's stories. And I think this is the last one. But she was a young girl. She had a paper route. She knew she wanted to spend money at Christmas and buy all her siblings a present. She came from a really big family. So she, she was a real penny pincher. She saved every penny of her money. She put it in a little shoe box in her room and she saved it. And coming up to Christmas time, she had about a hundred dollars. And back 40 years ago, that's a lot of money for a kid. <coughs> so at one point her mom said to her, well, I, I better hold on to that money because, you know, you might lose it or something might come up and you're going to spend it. Why don't I just hold on to it for you? And, at this point, Anita already knew that her mother was not trustworthy, but her mom really kind of pushed that and encouraged that. It'd be safe and okay, I'll give it back to you a couple weeks before Christmas and you can buy some presents. So Anita finally said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, my money. Of course, two weeks before Christmas came and her mom's not coming forth with the money, so she has to go to her mom and say, Mom, where's that hundred dollars? There's no hundred dollars left. I'm, I'm sure you spent it on clothing and we spent it on this and school supplies came out of that money and stuff. And at that moment she learned she could never ever trust an authority figure again. So it just impacted her in a huge way. I can't remember how old she was, 11, 12. But there's usually those defining moments when all of a sudden you say, okay, I'm done. I cannot trust anymore. And that causes a lot of problems in the future. Again, especially if it's the people, in case of parents, who were supposed to trust the most, and then they let us down, and it's like, okay, who can I trust if even my parents can't be trusted? Yeah. It's mostly like broken promises with that when I think yeah. my dad would promise all yeah. this stuff. And then at the last yeah. second, he goes, well, I didn't want it. It wasn't my idea. And it was like, all of a sudden, we have my head. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, you know, like, he just set us up constantly for that letdown. Heartbreak, yeah. 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 Absolutely. 
Number 10 is we're hypersensitive to disrespect. Okay, I'm gonna start over on that word. I cannot talk and write at the same time. Oh my goodness, hypersensitive. There we go. Sensitive to disrespect. So when a child is growing up and in their family, there is uh, a double standard. So um, I know as a, a child, we were drilled into us. We have to respect everybody. Respect, respect, especially our parents. Uh, there's no way you could ever say anything uh, to them or against them that they're not going to like. Respect, respect, respect. However, on the flip side, he never respected us and our needs and our wishes and our wants and our desires. There was absolutely no respect there. So um, now, because I was raised in that environment of disrespect, I am super sensitive to disrespect. If somebody even looks at me sideways, my emo uh, immediately, right? I have this nanosecond response of they're disrespecting me. I read into it all the time. Somebody might just have looked because they were looking for somebody else in the room, but I, I caught their eye and I, I assumed they're disrespecting me and I just feel this overwhelming feeling of shame. It's like, how could they do that to me? And then of course when you talk to them about it, they're like, no, I was doing something else. I'm sorry, I didn't even see you there, right? But I'm gonna read into it because there's no way I'm gonna feel shame from anybody else. The other part of that is uh, uh, being bullied. Um, children who are bullied, we learn that that's a really big one for them. Anyone disrespects them and they just, they just don't know how to handle it. Um, and then we talked the other day about sarcasm. Sarcasm comes in here too, right? So, oh, I was just kidding, it was a, just a joke. You shouldn't have such sensitive feelings. You're fine, you're fine. Well, I'll tell you that knife goes in pretty deep and it hurts that disrespect. They may say it's just a joke, but it's not. My parents way of them, they used to say we do the big thing you in front of all the jokes and stuff. Right. Because we're trying to toughen you up for the real world. Oh, you're too, yeah. They'd say I was too... Um, Sensitive. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever, right? And I'd, yeah. But it would just be like embarrassing. I'd be the front line of right. such really embarrassing thing. Oh, yeah. Right? And then, oh, yeah. Like, and then I just had to talk to my dad. So I said, why did you do that? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're trying to toughen you up for the real world. Oh wow! <laughs> Crazy, eh? Oh, and just what it does to the the child, eh? The inside, you, the humiliation you feel, and the, you know, it's, it's just a horrible feeling. Okay, the eleventh is we judge ourselves harshly. So we judge ourselves harshly because failure was punished in our home, for many of us. Uh, we learned that if we didn't get it right the first time, then we don't do it at all. There's no way we're going to do something and fail because failure was a sign of weakness, a sign that you're just not good enough, lots of shame comes in. So if we don't we'll do it perfectly, we hear, even as adults, so we'll try to do something and we don't do it perfectly, and what happens is we get all those old tapes from our parents playing in our head. You're not good enough, so you shouldn't have tried it. You'll never be able to accomplish this. All those old tapes keep going on over in our heads. Even when we grow up and say, I'm, I'm out of here, I don't listen anymore. But because you've kind of been raised on it, as soon as you do something wrong or make a mistake, all those thoughts keep coming right back. So in a healthy family, in a healthy family, failure was part of life. And it was used as a resource to help you learn how to grow and do things differently. And it was never a negative thing. So when we think of failure now, I mean, I don't even want to admit that I would ever fail with anything. But in a healthy family, you fail and it's like, oh, okay, I can do that differently. Maybe I'll do it this way this time. And that's a healthy response to it. But we can't do that. We judge ourselves because we can't accept the fact that we'll fail at anything. I heard all of these lovely phrases growing up. Did oh, you? Seriously. Yeah, you're stupid, you can't do anything right, you're a loser. Yeah, and I, I remember going to, um, to grade one, my first teacher uh, was a nun, and she told me I was smart. 
and I was shocked. Wow. Because I had heard the reverse. As it turned out, she was right. Okay. And I started getting really high marks because of one teacher who told me I was smart. Something nice, yes. But then, later, if I got, you know, I could have five A's and a B. I'd get punished for the B. Oh. It was just wrong. That's horrible, <laughs> yeah. That's horrible. So, yeah. Um, and I was just, I would just drive myself to, yeah. you know, yeah. to get top marks. So, yeah. not necessarily because yeah. I wanted them, just so I wouldn't get punished. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. It's yeah, a lot of pressure. I had that school thing too. Yeah, yeah, did you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I got five A's. Yeah. So Why one. wasn't that one yeah, an A? Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's horrible. Yeah. Yep. Because we can't be good at everything. Always things. We're not good at it. And that's okay. That's I part of that's who we are. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Actually, actually, a lot of schools down there. They're now they're going that way. Yeah. So, yeah. As long as you're trying and you're learning and doing your thing. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Uh, I just have one example from that from our own React Center. Um, we had on Wednesday afternoons we decided to do some guitar lessons. So Britt plays guitar. So she was and every afternoon we do guitar lessons. And there was one girl I'll call her Leah. And Leah, um, she was came from complex trauma, obviously. Um, but she would pick up the guitar and we'd go through the notes and we'd explain stuff. And so. We got to a point about four weeks in where we, where Brittany wrote off a song. Now, okay, now we're gonna sing the song and just do our basic strumming. And so I was in the class, I was watching, and I saw Leah, and she'd do a strum, and then she couldn't get her fingers into the chord fast enough, and I saw her face just turn bright red, and she pulled her hands away, and you could tell it was because she was so shamed and felt that she was gonna be criticized for wrecking the rest of everybody else who was playing, that she just stopped and she couldn't go ahead because of that shame. She was judging that she didn't do it perfectly and couldn't get it as fast as everybody else, so she couldn't do it. She just, I, mean, I just saw her face just fall. She was so disappointed in herself because she couldn't make it work. But uh, luckily, Brittany was in the room and said, you know, you're, it's good, you look, you've only had four lessons, you're learning how to change your chords, and she was encouraged, and finally after about eight classes, she was doing really well, and we gave her lots of praise for that. But even when she made a mistake, it's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. We're learning, and we all learn at a different curve. Any other comments? Oh, yeah, I'll just take, keep talking forever, won't I? Okay, let's take a break. Do it about five to seven minutes, because we've got 60 really uh, superly criticized as children, of course they grow up feeling like there's something wrong with them, they're stupid, they're, they can't do anything right, and then they pick up that negative view of their own abilities. So they just don't think that they're going to be as good as the other person. Now, I have a son, he's 31, and uh, he's very much like me, but because he was just at a real critical age when... Tim was in bed all the time, and I, he was really sick, and so I turned into a control freak. What I tried, what I thought I was doing was giving, as a parent, constructive criticism. You know, you need to make this kind of decision because this will have repercussions for the rest of your life, and you shouldn't do this. And look, but what he took it at, and it, I was probably overly critical. He took it all as criticism, and so he started to get really. Uh, really negative and critical himself against me because I was the parent trying to show him what to do to, to you know, save heartache in the long run, but he didn't see it that way. So I, I own my part in that. I probably pushed him too hard. He was the oldest of three kids, all really close together, so he had to be the model child, right? So he actually went the opposite direction and did all the bad things and got himself into a lot of trouble. But um, the, the point of that was that um, even now, when I talk to him about something, we do some renovating stuff actually together, and I'm trying to teach him how to do something, I have to do it very carefully, because if, if he even sniffs that I'm saying he's doing something wrong, he'll fly off the handle, because he's got complex trauma too. So when I'm talking to him about anything that I want to kind of lead him or direct him into anything, 
I have to watch my P's and Q's so carefully to make sure that he doesn't take that as a criticism of him and who he is. Brian, in case you're wondering, I do a 10 second pause at the end for anybody to share any of their experiences that relate to that. On every single point? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes I do. On every person on every point. No, no, just <laughs> <laughs> All right, number, thir <laughs> number 13, don't do well with stress. So as children of complex trauma, we were taught how to deal with stress in a healthy way. So normal stress, and everybody's life has periods of stress in, in, you know, just the way they live and their families and sicknesses and illnesses and job changes. I mean, those, those things all relate to stress. And I don't know if you guys all did the stress survey um, that we handed out the other day. Um, some of you probably have a lot of stresses in your life, and that's normal. It's not a good thing when you're overloaded by stress, but that's a part of life. So there's, there's actually two kinds of stress that Tim often talks about. Um, the good kind of stress is called U stress, so EU stress, and the negative kind is called distress. So basically what he's saying is that no matter what we do, there's always going to be some sort of stress in our life, um, good or bad, and we just have to learn how to deal with it in a Right. So in a healthy family, a uh, parent would come along the child or the teenager and say, okay, you got a lot of stress in your life, let's find ways to manage the stress, let's maybe prioritize some of your tasks so that you don't have to do everything, maybe we can just do the things that need to be done today and this week and then we'll put off some of the other things. They'll give you healthy tools, they'll also teach you how to do self-care. You know, if you're really overwhelmed with stress, um, you know, Let's go somewhere and just kind of take a day to ourselves. Uh, why don't I'll, I'll do some of your responsibilities? You can go read a book. I mean, those are all healthy things that a parent can do. However, we don't didn't get all those tools. So now, what we do, and I've made a list of things that I've heard people do when they're stressed: they act out, teenagers especially. They cry. They ignore their responsibilities until it's a huge pile of stuff that they can't possibly manage. They use humor to kind of avoid anything. They isolate. Like flight freeze, uh, use unhealthy behaviors like drugs or alcohol to numb and avoid and to disconnect. So those are all the things that we do when we're in from dysfunctional families or uh, complex trauma. But there is a healthy way to deal with stress because everybody has stress at periods in their life. tricky thing, right? We all develop some type of coping that we're comfortable with. Yeah. But it can be borderline unhealthy for other people that well, compare yeah. to ourselves. As, uh, yeah, we have to learn what works for us and what is in a healthy environment. And I think uh, the term that we would use is if we do something that will alleviate some of our stress, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else or their plans, you know? I'm gonna procrastinate because that feels good to me, but if it's gonna screw up the family system, whatever, that's not a good thing. So you gotta learn what's healthy. Like I use multiple things that if they were in excess, I could recognize that those would be unhealthy. Like right. It would become an addiction. It would be the go-to thing yes. whenever I was stressed. Yeah. But you know, there's a variety of things that, you know, right now, I know there's comfort food in the fridge, so I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> because I like, I like good sweets, right? Yeah, but that's yeah, yeah. not like a common <coughs> recurring. I think. Right. Is there something to be said for that? Right. Like how we can actually have a measure of using different coping. That's a healthier thing than being in a rut with something that could become an addiction. Right. That's a good that, question. Do you want to answer that? Well, I don't know. Like, I, I think what you it, tell me if I'm answering your question or not. But I think it really comes down to whether you're avoiding what's going on or actually dealing with it or going to deal with it eventually. Because, oh, I mean, if you're, if you're running around doing a whole bunch of different stuff. In the midst of dealing with it, there's still some comfort in coping with 
Yeah. Some things, even a little bit of isolation. Of course. To, you know, to yourself in a good headspace or finding yeah. something to eat just to preoccupy your feelings for a little while. But yeah, not avoiding. Right. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the balance, and you got to find the balance between self-care and what helps you kind of alleviate some of the stress. And like Britt says, just avoiding, and I'm not going to do that. Yeah. It sounds like it's a little bit of a treat yourself. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, this is just, yeah, this is very much an introduction to all the topics in phase one. Yeah. So number 15, and we all understand this one, anger issues. So healthy anger, healthy anger, we're all designed to have healthy anger in our life. Healthy anger is to correct anything that violates love, justice, truth, or respect. So if something is happening out on the street and uh, somebody's uh, love, is, love is being violated, we need to go out there and help and jump in and, and fix it. It's okay to be angry. Um, but we tend to get angry when our needs aren't met, when we're kind of sulking, we're doing, we're not feeling like anybody's listening to us, and that, that's not a healthy anger. So again, it's another complicated issue, anger, because it's okay to be angry, but it's not okay to be disrespectful and rude to other people. So the feeling of anger is not the issue, it's how you respond to the feeling that comes through that. Yeah, yeah. The feeling of anger, anger is a secondary emotion. Right. Because it's usually. I'm feeling hurt. Or somebody is. Yeah. Being hurt. Yeah. And I'm angry about that. Yeah. You never just feel angry. Right. Yeah. First you feel hurt, and then you feel that yeah. somebody else is violating. Yeah. Yeah, see, that's the, the thing there. Something has violated love. Somebody's not feeling loved. Justice, truth, or respect. So, yeah. So something is happening, and then our emotion is anger. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So unhealthy anger is a fight, and if we don't deal with the issues, the underlying issues, then it becomes an explosion, and usually somebody is hurt by that. You also see people going by anger out of fear. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, because mad, uh, anger is easier to deal with than fear, right? So if I'm afraid of something, I'm going to lash out because I can handle anger. I mean, most people know how to anger, handle anger, and they kind of get it out there and hurt other people in the process. That way, they, that way I don't have to deal with those uncomfortable feelings, the other emotions that are going on inside. Okay, I think I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh. One more thing on anger. Yep. Just to clarify, I think a lot of people, as soon as they hear anger, they just kind of tune it out, well, I don't have anger issues because I don't yell and scream and punch people in the face. But still, everybody has deals with anger in their own way. So even if it's just the passive aggressive, right? I'm going to use sarcasm or I'm going to take little shots at people or I'm going to um, try to hurt them in these little subtle ways, right? There's different ways of feeling anger and expressing anger than just the lashing out that everybody sees um, as the really negative thing. But I think everybody um, has anger issues in it. Yeah. And the other part of that is anger turned towards yourself becomes depression. So it's, uh, there's anger underneath in different ways. All right. Emotional stuffing. Okay, so there's three rules in a family with complex trauma. Don't feel, don't talk, and don't trust. So we learn to hide everything inside and not let anybody see it, but we become disconnected from our feelings because we're not allowed to feel. We're not allowed to feel anything except for happy. We're allowed sometimes to feel sad, but usually you get sent to the room if you, I did. If, you, if you're feeling sad, go to your room and come out when you're happy, right? So we're allowed to feel happy. We all know what happy is. But we're not allowed to feel those other things, so we don't. We start to uh, disassociate, and we can't understand what those feelings are anymore. So we stop anything that makes us feel weak or vulnerable because we don't want to be laughed at or disrespected. So we just disconnect. We don't want to feel anything. Happy is the only thing I can be. Then number seventeen is a negative and critical mindset. So we look for, we, we have a word in our family, we, we call it being censorious. And being censorious is when something happens and I'm going to assign a negative characteristic to that. So somebody gets up and uses the phone. If I'm a censorious person, I kind of roll my eyes and go, yeah, yeah, they're just trying to hook up with somebody or get drugs or do whatever, right? So I'm always attaching a negative um, motive to anything that happens. So, we could be having a lovely conversation, and you say something. I'm in my mind. I'm like, oh, 
they're they're just a terrible person. They're, they're an idiot. They're making bad decisions or whatever. They, they could not be, but I'm going to perceive it all as being very negative. Everything that comes into my mind is negative and corrupt. And you probably all know somebody who's like that. Everything they say is negative. And it gets so exhausting just to be around this kind of people. 18 is numb and avoid. Again, this kind of goes with the emotional stuffing. Any kind of uncomfortable emotions, and we're going to kind of shove them down, numb and avoid. And I've listed all the things that sometimes we do um, to escape any of those emotions. We numb, we avoid. Um, and the only way to get rid of those feelings in a healthy environment is to experience them fully. As long as you've got somebody that either you can talk to, you can journal, you can pray, um, you have to feel the feelings in order to make them real. Right? 19, escape through fantasy. We hear this actually a lot more than I, I was kind of surprised when I hear this. So kids who are in these traumatic experiences and traumatic families, they kind of make a fantasy world or a fake world where they, they mentally go to in order to just kind of ride the ponies in the pasture or, you know, it could be going to Disneyland if they've been there, you know, they experience them. And they can mentally put themselves there and they can block out everything that's happening over in their world and their families. It becomes a fantasy world. So it's, it's not just in childhood, but Brittany actually had a friend who was obsessed with weddings, okay? At 14 and 15, she had her wedding plan. She came from a family that was a little dysfunctional, a good Christian family, but very dysfunctional. And so she bought wedding magazines at like 13 and 14 years old, and she had scrapbooks, and her entire existence uh, worked around these beautiful settings of weddings and the perfect husband and the, you know, the perfect party and the, I mean, it was really, really, when you look at it in hindsight, it was pretty sick. That's all she could talk about because that's where she went in her fantasy world. There, everything was perfect and everything was happy and she didn't have to worry about anything going on. So, uh, yeah, kids do that more than we even realize when it's in extreme situations of uh, either neglect where they don't feel that they get any attention from their parents or something like that. Well, I think even a lot with today, like Netflix and movies and TV, people do that all the time through that, right? Because it's it's an entire different world that you can kind of put yourself into, again, to escape the world that you're in. Um, I, I know I even did this when I was a kid, but I would fantasize about something I would want. So. Uh, as a kid, I would make forts all the time at home. So I would fantasize about this awesome tree fort that I wanted to live in and just make this like this world around this tree fort that I could um, fantasize about and it would just solve all my problems if I could actually get to that. Um, so it doesn't have to just be, um, um, yeah, the normal things that we think about. It can be anything that you created in mind. I did that um, as a child because I was an afterthought. So my siblings were already in school oh, and everything yeah, yeah. when I was born, and so I imagined a whole family. Yeah, I did. You know, I had a whole different family in there. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I had a student years ago, so this would be a student from 10, so you're talking about 16, 16 years old. So obsessed with Harry Potter, and although it's kind of cute at first, it's also a little bit young for her age, but she had just lost her mom had her cancer and it was so painful for her. She could only ever talk. So when she'd even come into the counseling office, she could only talk through the metaphors of Harry Potter. So it wasn't until I jumped into Harry Potter that I could actually relate to her. And yeah. She would identify everybody. She'd come in and say, I think you're Gryffindor. And, I could, oh. and by learning, and then I had to do research. So yeah. by learning about who these people were and those parts were, then I could finally get an idea of who she thought her mom was, who she like, thinks her dad is, who she thinks. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was quite amazing. Extreme, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's all they talk about. Yeah, yeah. Well, interesting. Jim, did you have your hand up? No. Or do you have I was pointing to her. Oh, okay. Because I got to see her. Right. All right. And number twenty, authority figures. <laughs> 
Oh, sorry, authority issues. Oh, I know, I know. All right, so um, the authorities in our family often were ones who misused or abused their authority. So kids had to do extreme things in order to get their needs met and uh, to get their wants. Um, but the authority was never allowed to be challenged, never allowed to um, question them or uh, disagree with them or anything like that. So often the truth gets twisted when you have an authoritarian parent who isn't, you know, doesn't have enough to integrity to kind of help the kids through their stuff. So they cause a lot of damage and twist the truth and make the child feel guilty for having needs. So having authority issues often leads to ODD, which is Oppositional Defiant Disorder, which you, an authority figure tells a child to do something, and we all know what they're going to do. They're going to do the exact opposite. Okay, what I'm going to do is, uh, that was the first 20. We still have 20 to go, and we only have an hour. So I want you to just stand up and stretch a little bit, and then we're going to start into part two. Just don't go too far from your seats. I don't want you running away. Run away, we all together. Let's keep moving. We got one hour left. we start to abuse our authority. That's just the cycle of what happens, right? When you're a kid, think about when you're a kid and your parents abuse your, their authority and whatever, all you're thinking in the back of your mind is wait till I get some kind of power, wait till I get grown up, I'm gonna be able to do this and this. The problem is we always say we're never gonna be like our parents, we're never gonna be like our dad, we're never gonna do those awful things that they did to us, and chances are we probably do. So we hear this all the time. Um, I had an abusive dad, I'm gonna be such a great dad, and then they get up, and because they have kids, and that's all they know, that was what was modeled for them, they end up usually abusing their kids. We've heard clients say that my dad had an, an anger problem. I'm never gonna be an angry person. They almost always end up being an angry person. Um, the alcoholic, of course, the parent of clients come in and say, oh, I hated my, my mom because she drank all the time. And then they come in and they're drinking all the time and doing the exact same thing. So when they talk about that generational thing, it's because you're modeling for your kids how to cope, how to deal with anger, how to control issues, how to uh, do all these other things. And if that's what's modeled for you, of course you think that's the way it goes. So the next one, number 22, is we usually operate by a double standard. Uh, there's usually two sets of standards for um, a family. The authoritarian person can do whatever he wants, and everybody else under him is not, he's not allowed to do whatever they want. So anger is usually a big one with the double standard. Dad's allowed to get angry. Of course he is. He's the boss. But nobody else had better show any signs of anger or there's going to be trouble. So anger is one of the big ones. 23 is a fear of getting hurt, and that's, uh, that kind of is all a big part of the complex trauma piece is in childhood, there was just hurt all the time. So as somebody gets into adulthood, they avoid pain at all costs because they don't want to get hurt again. Number 24 is the fear of change. 
Um, we have a huge amount of fear running our lives, so any kind of change paralyzes us. We get people who come into the, the center and um, anything that changes, even the most minute detail, you know, we, we'll, ch we'll, um, we'll have something scheduled in the afternoon and something comes up that can happen, so we'll put something else in and, and they're, they're almost paralyzed by fear. It's like, well, I wasn't prepared. I was, I was prepared for more guitar lessons. Why is it crochet lessons this afternoon? I, I've never done it, I can't do it. There's too much change and they can't handle any of that kind of change. It sounds silly, doesn't it sound silly? But it's true, it's true. Oh, I haven't been leaving 10 seconds in between. Does anybody have a comment on those first four? We're all good at those. You're all good at those. Yeah, change is great. Yeah, change. Are we gonna, is there anything on authority that can get you more in depth or not? Authority figures? Brett, you do face two more than I do. Um, I mean, we go into relationships a lot. Um, yeah, it's talked about, but just nothing like an entire session on it, probably. I just remember when my parents got divorced, my mom said to me that I couldn't cry because now I needed to be the big girl. Oh, and the responsibility for a kid. Yeah. And so that I'm always surprised when I come across people with a fear of change. Uh, you know, I, I love it. And yeah, I like, love you too. <laughs> you could live with me for a, few, a week. So, right, that just, that's yeah. fun. Yeah, that is. And then all I see people are just like yeah. paralyzed. I'm like, what yeah. just happened? Yeah. Just, we were going to do this, now we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, it does. Now yeah, you I, understand. And I have to catch myself. Yeah. And just realize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For some people, that's very significant. It is very significant. For me, significant. it's fun. Yeah. But for yeah. some people, it's. Yeah. Most yeah. likely, you're a pioneer and you like change and you want to cause it. Yeah. And that will stress up the managers who don't want to change things. They don't want to start something new. Uh, I wanted to say something about authority. When you had number 20 authority issues, my mind went to my oldest son. Because he went through, like, before they end up in, in the orphanages, um, they um, had two engineer parents, and the parents were doing business, so there was a lot of, a lot of neglect okay. to the kids, so they make a fortune for the kids. Okay, yes. And then um, they ended up in orphanages for five years. So my oldest son has huge authority issues in the sense that he cannot submit to authority. Right. You cannot accept authority. Otherwise, number 20 and 24 is the same thing. How, we use, how our parents use it, how we use it, it's kind of the same. Yeah. But I think authority issues is having difficulty taking orders, taking yeah. direction. Yeah. And I've seen um, one lady who said my parents were very controlling of me. Right. I will never do that. So she had a two-year-old who was tantruming and running the house because she never said that. <coughs> yes, with him. You can you know swing the other extreme. It's still, it's yeah. still leaving her parents. Yeah. Situation yes. because she went to total permission. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it can be one way or another. Just authority issues are all messed up. Yeah. yeah. But she thought she's not going to do what they did. Right. She was still doing it. Yeah. Only yeah, opposite, the opposite version. way. Yeah, exactly. Very good example. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> what comes to mind as we continue to discuss these, which is super interesting to see all these different traits, is that even though there's no real, you know, silver bullet to get rid of all of it like this, and everybody's at their own pace as to how they cope with this and how they work towards health. It's so interesting to be able to understand the people in our world right? and, and how we deal with it. Like the change thing is a big thing. I love change. Okay, I yeah. love change. I like yeah. going to new grocery stores. And <laughs> I love things like that. And I really do like change. It doesn't stress me out at all. But if I don't understand that about people in my world, that they hate change, yes. mm -hmm. I'm going to be like, I'm like, Whoa, well, let's do this. Let's yeah. just change it. And yeah. then you're wondering why there's this conflict over there. You're, you're causing so much stress to someone else exactly. unknowingly. So this is quite interesting. Yes, yes. yes. Absolutely. For me, change gets harder as you get older. Yes. Mm -hmm. it well, does. I was fine with myself. When, but then they change it from rotary. <laughs> 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 
I'm using this course to get through my complex drama. Right? So now I just go to my two-year-old, he shows me how to do it. Seriously. I've often wondered, you know, because so many um, people out on the streets, sometimes you give people an opportunity to do something different, and it doesn't happen, and I, I hope, you know, I always find myself wondering oh, yeah, how yeah. much fear of change when it comes into play there. Yeah. Even when it's way better. Yeah. Even when it can be way better. Well, but way by, yeah, way better by, by my standards. Right. right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, because it's got to be yeah. really scary for people. Well, you know. Which let's just go to the fear of the unknown, which oh, yeah, is a similar right thing, right? <laughs> Because I have the example of, uh, you think of it's late, late at night and there's no moon and no stars and you're out on the edge of a forest and somebody is asking you to take a step into the forest and you, you can't see to lift your foot up and go into the forest, right? I mean, terrifying. That's how they feel. They have to just take the first step and be okay with that first step. It's still pitch, pitch black, and you can't see any further. And now you're asking them to take another step into this unknown place. This, they don't know if it's full of wolves and ditches and logs you're going to trip over, but now you're asking them to take another step. And they're terrified. They do not know what to expect. And it's, uh, it's a very, I mean, for us, it's like, yeah, we'll skip on through. It's not a big deal. But for people with complex trauma, that unknown will just absolutely paralyzed. Now, go ahead. I think especially this is a good example for people in abusive relationships mm -hmm. because we think, well, why would they want to stay in that? Like, it's awful. But when it comes to fear of change in the unknown, they get so comfortable with the abuse and they know what to expect that it becomes more okay then changing something totally different like that's terrifying when they can live in something that they know is what to expect and they've also learned all the tricks to keep themselves safe right so they listen for the door how hard is the door being slammed what are the footsteps like coming up so they know what to expect and they can kind of change their behavior to make sure they stay safe so for us to come along and say you need to get out of that abusive relationship and let's go and we'll take you somewhere else well there, there's no way they're going to go because that's all kind of a big, scary, dark forest. They're not going to just easily walk into that. What was that saying? The, the better the devil that you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We have to remember that the cycle of abuse has the honeymoon stage. Yes. We're going to talk about that. Yes. Oh, soon. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, All right. So then there's the fear of failure. That's our next one. Um, this stops us from growing and learning. Okay? So in a healthy home, we talked about this already, failure was a lesson that you learned so that you could do things better the next time. Uh, but in an unhealthy home, you were you were punished for failing, and so the point of, of that is that we're too afraid to even try anything. We're just going to stay with what we know and kind of kind of live our li lives out without having to have any of that fear of of failing and making a mistake and feeling that shame and humiliation all over again. So we refuse to try anything new. And again, that's people out on the streets. They're not going to change. They're afraid that what happens if They've done it so many times, right? The cycle. Well, what if ha happens if I go into one of the pods and then something happens and I get kicked out? And I mean, they've been there. They know all that. So it's easier just to not try anymore, just to kind of live in failure. And then down here we have fear of success. And I think, Ron, you mentioned that the other day, this fear of success, right? Yeah. So we have had so many failures in our life and so much hurt that Success, we don't quite know what to do with it. It's not, uh, it's not a comfortable emotion. It's, uh, we're, we're just not sure where it's going to end up. So I have this quote on the bottom. I'm just going to read it. It's on page, I don't have the page number. Five. Thank you, page five. Uh, at the very bottom, Marianne Williamson has written, 
Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? We don't know what to do with that. You know, I've, uh, I've, uh, we watch the American Idol thing, and you, you see some of these kids that come on there, and they just have had no support. And no, I mean, you can, you can picture them out of the crowd when you see them kind of interacting with the interviewers and stuff. They're so low in self-esteem. So they get up onto these shows, and they sing, and they're... The judges are praising them, and they're, they're a puddle on the floor. They don't know what to do with praise or happy feelings or success of any kind. It just kind of takes them out. They don't know what to do with that. Art, number 28. And we don't have to get through all these. We can always do more tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. All right. We want hope. But we're afraid to hope. <laughs> okay, so you see that little graph on the page underneath number 28. A, a, a child is two, three years old, and Daddy says we're gonna we're gonna go somewhere. So they get themselves all ready, and they they get their hope up, and then Daddy says, "Oh, I'm too tired. We're not going today." So they're dope. Their hopes are dashed. They're crashed. They're brokenhearted. But they come again and Dad says, well, uh, maybe next week we'll do something special. We'll go for ice cream. So they get their hopes up and then on the weekend, Dad doesn't want to do it. He's got other plans. He's out golfing. So hopes are dashed. And it goes on and on and again. The kids are so resilient. They will hope and hope and hope and hope and hope and hope all their lives until they get to a point where they're just afraid to hope. There's been too many broken promises. So... There's also, this comes into number 29, they self-sabotage. So they've done all this hope and dashed, hope, dashed all their life. They get into the, I've got into their 20s, 30s, 40s, and they've got something going on that's really good, and they've got hope that it's going to be okay, but they know that it's going, their hopes are going to be dashed. So they self-sabotage and crash it down again. They often will do that themselves. They'll just come in and make... Uh, make mistakes, break a relationship up because they know it's going to fail anyway. I might as well do it myself. It's easier to do it myself than have somebody else do it for me. Because then, my then I'm hurt even more. So we, I just wanted to go through the cycle of abuse. Well, maybe I'll go up to the top here. Um, I'm not sure, actually, to be honest. Sabotage. Yeah, it's under the sabotage heading. Because there's a, a part where we actually sabotage. So here we've got your honeymoon phase. Everything's going really well. There's a new relationship. you got a new job. Everything looks and feels really good. But then you're coming around the circle, and then pressure starts to build. So... The relationship is starting to show some cracks in it. Somebody's telling a lie, the other one's getting upset, needs aren't being met, the pressure's starting to build and build. So what happens is, we know how it's going to end because of the sabotage aspect and that hope dash, hope dash, hope dash. We know it's eventually going to fall. So when this pressure starts to build, we sabotage it right there. We sabotage. Because we know that when that happens, when there's sabotage, then it's going to come up. We're going to go through some hurt, neglect. We're going to possibly be abused. But we know the honeymoon is coming. So we come over to here. And then the person who's been the abuser or the one that's hurt you, they're all apologetic. And I'll never do it again. And I'll never pick up a drink again. I'll never use. It's going to be great. And then there's that honeymoon. And it feels really, really good. They're attentive. Your spouse is attentive. The job is great. Um, everything's going well. And then the pressure starts to build. It builds and it builds and it builds. And we know how it's going to end, right? It's going to end in abuse. So we're going to sabotage it. We get hurt. We get neglected. We get abused. But we know the honeymoon's coming. So it goes back around to the honeymoon. So that can be a cycle that lasts a long, long time, but the cycle gets shorter. Okay, so this honeymoon stage 
is not as long as it used to be. It used to be two weeks long and I'd get, my spouse would bring me flowers and he'd be all attentive and everything would be great. But now it's like, oh my goodness, the pressure is building after a day and a half. What am I going to do? Well, I got to sabotage faster so it'll get back to the honeymoon. And it goes around and around. So we often, the point is that we're going to do that ourselves. We're going to sabotage it ourselves because it's better if I do it and I get hurt than if somebody else ruins my life and ruins my hopes and, and my hopes are dashed. So does that answer your question? That was that cycle of, uh, of abuse? I guess it works. Okay. It works. <laughs> it's a different kind, maybe. <laughs> okay, so that's the sabotage. Any comments? Does anybody, can anybody relate to that? I can relate to that. I yes. Think, uh, I think I can relate to the idea that uh, maybe you're not even anticipating the honeymoon part, but you just uh, you just want to control how bad the hurt is. Because oh yeah. You, because you believe that the hurt is coming. Yes. And uh, yeah. if, if you if you continue on, the hurt could be huge. Yes. Uh, whereas if you sabotage it now, then you can control how bad right. the hurt is. Coming. Right. Right. Perfectly said. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to quickly say the noise behind you is the band setting up. So the little banging, and I can see you're all concerned. That's actually the band setting up. No rats in the No, no, no. <laughs> There's nobody being banging. They're just setting up some stomach, some stuff in there. No, no. Still right here. So. Number 30 is we have a fear of abandonment and we have a fear of rejection. So at this point when we have relationships, we're afraid of intimacy. Because if I get really close to somebody and open my heart up to them, we know that they're eventually going to uh, reject me, they're going to abandon me, and I'm going to be hurt even more than ever. So I don't want to get close. If I decide that it's worth maybe taking a risk, then I'm going to start to kind of test them a little bit. So I'm going to, um, you know, play the little games. I'm going to kind of check their phone, see what they're doing. I'm going to check up on them, phone their friends, and see if they're actually where they said they're going to be. I'm going to do those little games because I don't want them to abandon me. But the problem is that I'm actually setting myself up to be abandoned because who wants their phones checked all the time and people checking in on them. I had a friend actually whose um, boyfriend would check her odometer before she left the house and then find out where she was and then he'd drive the road to make sure it's the exact amount of mileage to make sure she wasn't lying. I mean, talk about trust issues, right? Yeah, crazy. So the games that we end up playing, well, I'm going to get to that later, but that's what actually leads to them abandoning us in the first place. We have a fear of saying no. We have a deep fear of saying no, okay? So do, we don't want to take the risk that if I say no, somebody won't like me. They're going to think that I'm not as good as somebody else. They're going to... Uh, uh, they're going to get mad at us for saying no. How can I, how could I say no to somebody? So what happens is, uh, we get clients all the time that, that have, don't have a clue how to say no. It's all about saying yes, 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 I'll do whatever you want, yeah, I'll do everything. Problem is, then they get all these responsibilities just piling up on them, and they crash and burn, and they go abuse. They're, they just can't handle all the yeses that they've said. So we do a lot of uh, teaching people about, this is all about boundaries, right? Learning how to set boundaries for your own health, your mental health, uh, what you can physically accomplish in a day. But uh, people who come out of complex trauma, they're <laughs> so afraid of saying no and so afraid that people won't like them that they say yes and then they burn out. And you'll also find people who are also very dysfunctional who you will attract. <laughs> they know that you're never going to say no, so they know that they can walk over. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. But they it's do. weird because when you do say no, you end up losing a lot of them anyway. Mm -hmm. Because they can't walk over. Yes. 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 So you're of no use to them. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So then we'll find somebody else who'll say yes. Like this weird cycle. <laughs> yeah. It's another big cycle. Yeah, you got it. Uh, we are afraid to be a burden or a pain. We 
we don't want to be a burden to anybody. So, of course, we were, uh, when we were growing up in a home and if we had a need and we went to mom and dad and said, I need this or I want this or can you do this for me? We were met with eye rolling and sighs and oh, I'm so busy and how could you ask of this? And it becomes really, really discouraging. I mean, I, my mom was like that. She had three little kids under two years of age. I get it. Doesn't mean it was okay, but I always felt like I was a burden. So I could never ask her for anything because, oh, she's so fragile. She might fall apart. So I need to look after all these needs and wants on my own. It's a really hard thing to do, but even up into my 40s, I was afraid to be a burden. I didn't want to ask anything of anybody because, you know, everybody's got busy lives. I knew a lot of my friends, they had jobs and kids, and I mean, for me to ask something of them, oh my gosh, I'm going to send them over the edge. Or what if they don't know how to say no either? And then they're going to crash and burn because they're overwhelmed with too many things. So I was never able to do that. Also, as kids, we were made to feel that uh, as asking for help was a sign of weakness. So how dare you ask somebody for anything because that means you're not able to do it yourself. How would you do that? How could you think that? I think, I think that's actually the cementing of the asking being a burden. Say it again? That's it's, the cementing part Yes. asking being a burden. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Find, like, I'm just yeah. going to share my own. Like, yeah, my please. Mind, both self-employed, work home for a lot, and so we have to talk about and boundaries and when is it work time, when is yeah. it family time. And so the kids coming and asking and you know come into our work space right? yeah. and how we balance that out. It's like you can't ask right now. Right. And, and that's okay, that's a good boundary. A waiting period. And so there's a discouragement. But then we reinforce for a healthy measure, it's okay to ask for help. We're waiting for you to ask for help. And you know there's gonna be time for you to help. So that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a totally healthy response. Yes. And we say no a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it just has to happen. Right? Yeah. Well, if you're working out of the house, that's a, you know, the boundaries have to be pretty firm. But yeah, yeah. All right. Here's a different one altogether. We fear losing what gives us value. So if we gained our value from the wrong source, we're always going to be fearful of losing it. So I mean, I've written a few examples there. Body image. I mean, how many girls grow up if they have a beautiful body or a beautiful face or whatever? They get their value from that. And then you hit 40. I've, I've heard a lot of people hit 40 and they go, I'm not beautiful anymore. I don't have this slim, beautiful figure. What's my value? Well, they put their value in the wrong place to begin with. So when they start losing it, they don't know who they are anymore or what value they have. I mean, that's huge in our culture. Look at all this stuff for wrinkle cream and all, of, all the surgeries you can do, you know? We put a lot of value as a culture on what we look like. And that is a scary, scary, scary thing because we can't stay young forever. I know you young ladies think that you will, but you won't. It's really, really scary. <laughs> yeah, even some other examples are like, um, people who eventually retire. Mm. Some people feel like they only have value in their job or what, they what they're able to do, yeah. right? So when they retire, it's like, what good am I now, right? What value do I have anymore? Because everything that I thought gave me value is gone. Yeah, that's a whole generation taught that. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. We have a client right now who was a very wealthy guy. He had all the toys and all the houses and all this kind of stuff. And uh, then, of course, he got caught up in addiction because of his lifestyle, and he lost everything. He came into our center, and he didn't know who he was. He tried to, you know, when we're chatting with him, he's like, well, well, I used to have lots of money, and I, I used to be able to go on all these trips, and I used to own all this. As soon as he started to realize that he was putting all his value in money, and that we valued him for who he was, not what he did. He's come a long way. He just graduated last Friday. I was so sad I missed his graduation because he went, again, 180 degree turn from, from just going down the wrong road to being a really wonderful, healthy human being. So yeah, he was a pretty cool guy. 34. And this, uh, this is what I alluded to. We create what we fear.
So, I've got a couple examples here. One, we, cr we crave validation because we were never validated as home, right? So as we come into our adult life, we crave validation from other people. So, we become really needy. You know, please tell me how great I am. I mean, we have, a, at our Finding Freedom program, we have a music program, and Britt's brought in a lot of, uh, she does a lot of music, so she's brought in other people who will do some singing and um, just kind of start them off on this new quest they have for music and stuff. But it's so funny because you, br you bring in some of these, some of the girls that you've brought in, I just shake my head, they come in and, and all they want is validation. So for the whole two-hour two evening, they're just going up to people and saying, so, so what do you think? Was I good? Or they'll say, I wasn't very good. What was I hoping? They will say, yes, you were really good. You sang beautifully. You have a gift. They want all that so badly, but they become so needy. It's exhausting. So what happens is then people just kind of, oh, here she comes. She just wants validation. She just wants praise for what she's done. So they go the other way. So what they wanted was validation, and now no one's even going to give them validation if they do a good job the next time, because they it's kind of like they've, uh, they've ruined the thing that they, they wanted so badly by being so needy. So there's one example. Second one is, we call it being a stage five clinger. Everybody know the movie? That comes from a movie anyway, stage five clinger. You want to be with the person, oh, so, so that we're talking about uh, like relationships, right? We want to be with the person constantly. Wherever they go, we're going to go. We're, uh, you know, we show up where they, we're at their work and, you know, I just want to be with you. And they, you know, just stage five players, they cling, they like glom onto somebody and you can't even push them away. They're stage five players. So the problem is what they really wanted, they really wanted somebody to be with 100% of the time. They're just craving that attention and that uh, intimacy with somebody. But the problem is the person that they're clinging on to and glomming on to gets tired of being smothered and start pushing them away. So you've created what you feared. You feared being left alone and not having anybody, so you glommed onto them and then they start pushing you away. You've just created it by being overly affectionate and overly clingy and wanting to be with them 100% of the time. And the third example is trusting relationships. If two stage five players stay together too long, they often develop codependence. Codependence? Yes. Yes. You can put it here. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we want a trusting relationship no matter what because I never learned to trust, but I think this new person I'm dating is I'm going to be able to trust them. So what do you do? And I alluded to this earlier. You start checking on their phone. You check phoning their friends, see if they're there. Where you. So you're wanting to make sure that you can trust them, but all the behaviors that you're doing is actually making them realize that you don't trust them and then they walk away they leave you so you've you've pushed and pushed and you're doing all these inappropriate things to make sure that they're a trusting person but what it does it just who wants to be controlled by that so they take off they're gone so all of these as you can see come from you know the shame stuff the priority to not get hurt as like we talked about at the beginning even a lot of these characteristics do and so what we fear I mean, people seeing us or not liking us or abandoning us or um, not being there for us, giving us what we need, we're now creating by fearing those and acting on them. So the priority of fear is ruining everything. 35. You can become super responsible or super irresponsible. So you can go either way on that. So if we're going to do everything perfectly, I'm going to make sure that it's done perfectly. I'm going to do all I can do to make sure that I am just this wonderful, perfect person and I never make any mistakes and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to prove to the world that I'm a good person. Or we can't do anything right. I know I'm going to fail at everything I do, so I'm going to do everything bad, and I'm going to make bad look good. Or not try at all. 
or not try at all. Yeah. So that all in one weekend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah. I like pushing, Push, pushing push. perfect Friday, yeah. all the way Saturday morning. Yeah. Breakfast. And yeah. then by Saturday night, I'm like, a dumb mama. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I'm drunk. laughs> yeah. That's cute. Yes, I can say that is probably true. Oh, oh goodness. How are we doing? Oh, we're almost there. Good. All right, 36 is a really obvious one. We're a people pleaser. <coughs> we thrive on other people's praise and validation. So we try to fix everybody. We try to make them all happy. We, this is where it crosses into codependence. We start doing things for people that they really should be doing for themselves. But the reason we do that is so that they will become more dependent on me. So now you've got a really unhealthy uh, relationship where one person is taking all the ownership and trying to do everything, and the other one is letting them do it all. So they always seem to find each other. The person who's doing all the doing always finds the person who wants to have everything done for them. So that's pretty, uh, pretty sad. 37. This is an enormous one. Image is more important than authenticity. So how we're perceived is way more important than who we really are. So we're uh, really not even sure if, if our real authentic person is worth anything because we usually have low self-esteem and we don't think we're worth anything, we don't have value. So we've got to make sure that on the outside our image is perfect. So uh, the externals, we've got to be good looking, we've got to uh, you know, take really, really good care of ourselves. Uh, we need to exude confidence because that's what our world admires and praises is all that confidence. Um, I've got to have a good job, I've got to have a perfect family, I've got to keep up with the life of the party, I, got to, I have to be that sexy person, i got to have a bad boy image. All those things are like masks that we talked about earlier. But this becomes a priority. The most important thing is to make sure everybody knows that I'm a better person than who I really am. But again, this goes right back to the very beginning. We can't have healthy relationships if we're not real. The other person doesn't want to date a mask. They want to date me as a person and get to know who I really am. But if we've got all that shame underneath, we don't want to make that happen at all. Thirty-eight. A couple dogs out there now. Uh, we don't know who we are. Parker. <laughs> All right, so if you look at the picture down on the bottom, this was, I, I just thought it was a really good example of, um, we've got this beautiful house, everything's really nice, we want to invite people in, they, we want to show them our stuff. I think we're going to have to slow down soon and soon because we're uh, getting drowned out here. That's okay. Well, that's okay, we can do that. Um, we, we allow people into our houses, the upper part of our houses, because we've got them all in order and everything looks good and we got the newest of everything. Um, everything's top of the line and, you know, I love renovating stuff, so I get all that. We want to make sure everything looks really, really good for everybody. But it's actually us hiding down in the basement and nobody is allowed down there. We're kind of sitting in that, that space where we don't really want anyone to come down and see the real us underneath. Um, we just want to show people the upside part of our house and what it looks like on the outside and the main rooms and stuff. But underneath the real me, we won't allow anybody down those stairs. So we have a lock on that door to the basement and it's going to stay that way because I can't allow it again. So that authenticity is almost uh, null and void. We can't do it. And because we're so used to focusing on the image, the external, wearing the masks, then we don't even know who we are anymore because we're so used to becoming other people or who other people want us to be 
that we've sort of totally lost sight of who we are as well. Yeah. That we don't even know what we're good at, what we like doing, um, all of that. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think we're going to call it quits. So tomorrow night. No, I, I, more. I honestly, I, I think we should continue to 6:30. Okay. It's actually best for us to continue with the evening if we do. Okay. I okay. think he's only going to be playing some guitar, and if that, I think that's okay for us. If okay, that's okay with you guys. Okay. With that? Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. We have two more here. 39. All right. So we're going to have boundary issues. And in all reality, Tim will spend an entire week on boundaries because it's such a huge topic with people in recovery or people with complex trauma because they have never been taught how to set healthy boundaries and we just don't want to say no to anybody and so everything is always yes, yes. So um, a healthy uh, boundary, I just wanted to put a couple things here, is one of them is we were never taught a healthy boundary or what we were entitled to put up as a boundary. I never knew growing up that I was allowed to say, I am in charge of my own body. Um, I think I haven't talked to you guys, but I did. I was sexually abused by a neighbor at one point. I really didn't know how to say no because I was never taught that my body was my own space. We are all entitled to have control and boundaries over Who's allowed to touch you? Who is not allowed to touch your body? That could be just a, a healthy, uh, healthy hug between friends, a pat on the bum by a ch you know a child mom to a child, all that kind of stuff. But then outside our circle, we have a right to say no to anybody. So um, let me just yeah. So physical touch, we're entitled to boundaries around physical touch. We're allowed to say how busy we want to be. I never knew I was allowed to say that when I was a, an adult because my dad controlled everything that we did. So now I can make choices on to how busy I want my life to be. So I didn't learn that for many, many years and I really burned myself out because I was also a pastor's wife and you all know pastor's wives are never allowed to say no. So anyone would call with an emergency and I'd be over there bringing them food or taking their kids or taking them to dentist. That was my job and my role. Then I learned about boundaries and realized that I could say no, I'm sorry. I, I understand you're having an emergency, uh, but I can't leave my kids right now. We're in the middle of something and it's important. I don't have to give them lots of excuses. I just need to learn how to say no. So I never knew I was allowed to say how busy my life was going to be or what I was going to do. I never knew that I was allowed, who was allowed in my life? In what, uh, there's, oh, people put up too many boundaries? Yeah, of course. It's an isolation tactic. Isolation tactic, yeah, yeah. I'm putting up boundaries and no one's getting close. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah. So I never, I was never taught that you could say, no, I don't really want to be your friend. That was a shock to me, especially again, I was a pastor's wife and I had all these people who were kind of demanding my attention, they wanted to be my friend, they, all this kind of stuff, and I was like, yeah, okay, okay, and we built a friendship. I thought that was what I was supposed to do, because I was a good Christian girl, right? But I learned growing up, I was allowed to say, no, I don't think that person is healthy enough, or I don't think that person is a good fit with my personality. I get annoyed at them every day. I don't think, I was allowed to say no. That was a, a kind of an eye-opening experience for me. Four, and these are just a, just a handful of examples that I really thought were important from my own perspective. I was allowed to say how I could spend my money. Can you imagine that? I was raised that you gave this amount to the church, and you gave this much to giving, and then you did this, and then all these other things you were supposed to give to other people or help other people with their needs and their wants. This is as a teenager. But if you, if I ever went out and spent money on a pair of shoes, what a selfish person I was, that money could have gone to something important. 
I get, I get out of life and I went, really? I'm allowed to make that decision? And of course, there's boundaries all over the place with that, you know, wasting money and being foolish and all that kind of stuff where we're uh, supposed to take our money and use it for good and all that kind of stuff. And that's all great. But I was also allowed to buy a pair of shoes. Isn't that wonderful? It was very exciting for me. So I got to choose all these things. These are all boundary issues that I never knew I could do. And I'm sure you guys will give me some examples of boundaries that you didn't really know, or even at this point, don't know if you're allowed to have boundaries or not. Those are just my examples. Anything? For a little while now. One important one that I think should be on there, but we are entitled to how people even treat us. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good one. We actually teach people how to treat us, but we are allowed to let people know that what people are saying or doing to us is not okay. And that's a huge thing. Yeah, 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 for sure. I remember as a teen, because I was so much younger than my siblings, I was everybody's babysitter. Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> And, uh, and I know one night, um, my sister-in-law had phoned me, asked me to babysit, and I got off the phone, and then all of a sudden my cousin was at my door, and she said, let's go to a movie, let's go do this, and, and I said, well, I just said to, to April that I was going to babysit, and uh, she says, well, let's do this later, I phone them and ask them how late they're going to be. Okay. And so I did, and oh my. Goodness, did that? Did I ever get into trouble? Did you? I got into oh, so much okay. trouble because I'd already made yeah. a commitment yeah. and I broke the commitment. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yes. The boundary issue is is big for helpers. Yes, it is. Because when you start helping, you are known for helping. Then you get these people who will always need help. Yes. So it's like somebody puts their jumper cables on your back and you never take them off. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. They drain you dry. Why? He said this and she did that. Like your oh, work oh, oh. break, your driving home all the time, <coughs> you're just counseling those people. After I adopted my kids, my daughter became the helper for her class. Okay. And I saw her on the phone. Oh, this classmate has this problem with that problem. And it happens again and again. And she spends hours on the phone. And I said, you know what? I think you're a counselor, but you're going to have to start charging. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> and uh, you when know, I broke that pattern from, for her, right. she actually, she was grade seven. Okay. And um, she, that's when I broke her because she was grade seven. So when I broke that pattern and clarified that to her, all of a sudden she made a different friend. Ah, By the yes. end of the year, she was friends with the best kids in the class. Nice. But in the beginning, she was friends with all the troubled kids right. and supporting them and counseling them. And she would not sleep enough because she would have to do her homework. But we do that a lot. We caregivers, counselors, we do that a lot. And Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we actually say that is a lot of people in the uh, healthcare professional and counseling profession, they're trying to meet their own needs by helping other people. And that is huge. A lot of people go into that mode of, well, I couldn't fix my family, but I'm going to fix yours. Yeah, you know? that's a codependency. That needs to be needed. Yes, codependency. Yes, yes. yes. We need to be needed. Yeah, exactly. Well, I remember when I was uh, trying to get healthy and trying to learn about boundaries. I actually wrote on a piece of paper. So I had my, um, I had so many friends that were just, I call it, they were sucking me dry. I, I just had nothing else to give and I was just getting burned out. So I put their names on a piece of paper and then I put pros and cons with a line down the middle. Okay, what do I like about being with this person? And you know, we have lots of laughs together. We encourage each other, you know, and I wrote a whole bunch of stuff. And then I, I put on the other side what I don't like about being friends with that person. And then I'd write, they, you know, they demand too much, they want me to take care of their kids, and then on what I want. And then I had to look at each person individually and say, hey, is this a draining friend or one that fills me up? 
And you have to really do that to find out which, I mean, yes, there's a point where you, you, you give until a point, until a, a spot, but there are some people that you're never going to make them all better. They're never going to be whole because all they're doing is sucking the life out of you and just moving on. I do do that with several friends. I had to actually tell one friend. She, it did not go well because, I again, I, I tried to be healthy, but I didn't have all the tools yet. And I tried to tell her that she was, I, I just couldn't be friends with her anymore because I just felt like I was always depleted and I was always, you know, de depressed by the end of a weekend and all that kind of stuff. She didn't take it well. We've talked since, you know, it was 20 years ago. But yeah, it's a, it, you come to a point where you just have to learn boundaries or else your own self-care is really suffering. You just have to do it. But you'll have a whole week in phase two on boundaries. You'll learn all about it. Yay. I know, right? Okay, we got one more. All right. We've talked about this a lot. Attachment is issues. Okay, so we are born pre-programmed to connect or to bond um, with a primary caregiver, somebody in our world. Uh, we're pre-programmed for that, and so there's Tim's done a lot of research on, you know, bonding and attachment theories and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we are programmed to do that. We have to connect with somebody. We long for intimacy. So in a healthy bonding uh, attachment family. The, uh, we feel safe and we feel protected from harm. We have somebody that's taking care of us. Um, we develop a meaningful connection and we feel loved. We learn how to balance our emotions because we need somebody to help us work through because we, we have all the emotions. We've got them all in our lives. We have to learn how to deal with them and how to balance them. We're taught how to deal with stress. We're given coping tools for stress, uh, self-care management. Uh, and then we create positive memories and expectations of this relationship. So as you grow up, you do fun things together and it gives the child a warm connection to you. You've got things that you can talk about in your past. Those are healthy bonding um, families. Now the unhealthy bonding family is the one that tunes out your needs. Uh, our parents are unavailable. They're either self-absorbed or they just don't care. Uh, you have the macho dad who's out doing his own thing, and so the children feel like they're neglected. We remain insecure if a parent is inconsistent. We don't know what to expect from day to day, and we talked about that one other day. You come home from school, and we're not sure if mom is going to be manic and kind of excited and doing all or depressed on the couch. So a child feels insecure coming home. So their attachment is going to be it's going to be a little wavering because they're not sure what to expect when they get home. Um, research shows that children who don't, are not attached to anybody, they are disorganized, they're angry, and they're aggressive. They also develop mentally, intellectually, they are slower learners than other people. They don't have that safe place in their own worlds where they can just relax and be themselves. There's a lot of fear and anxiety coming home from school, or if it's going to school, they just don't know how to connect with teachers or other children in their world. Any comments on that one? That's our final one for today. And there's lots we can talk about attachment. That'll, that'll be through all our uh, phase two stuff. Yes, I would say you're right. Yes. The look of autistic children. Yeah. The, the name autistic, uh, autistic comes from self. They are trapped in self. Trapped inside themselves. So, yeah. Whether it was something in our childhood or yeah. later on, at some point we learn that the world is not going to be safe. Right. So then we start kind of closing in a bit. Right.
anxiety is the biggest drive from the country right. to draw from some kind. But all these things still actually have a bigger natural And some kids are so um, hurt in their attachment that they get diagnosed ADHD, bipolar, um, all kinds of things, BPD, OCD. Um, and actually, when you look at the stages of attachment, and the biggest attachment um, guy is actually local here from North Africa, Dr. Gordon Mitchell. He has the best book for dealing with teenage issues. Okay. It's called Hold On to Your Kids. And he goes back to the Bible. Because the society today says you're attached to your parents, and you're attached to your peers, and then you grow up and get married. Wrong. You're attached to your parents. You remain attached to your parents. Because of that, you, you get along well with your peers, and you develop good marriage relationships. So he really um, brings it back to what should have been. And um, he gives six stages of attachment. Year one of life, year two, and up to six. And um, basically, when we're deficient in our attachment, it's because we cannot allow ourselves to feel the futility when we hit the wall with something. You know, like in the maze. You, you, you can't feel the futility and turn back. You just keep banging your hand to make a hole to go the way you want. And a kid who stole money from school, if it's uh, talked to, it will cry, will say, it will feel really bad about it. But a kid with attachment, Yeah, exactly. So that's yeah. the difference between. So we all have a little bit of hurt, a little bit of attachment issues, and we learn more or less. But kids with reactive attachment disorder, they kill. They can kill a pet, a sibling, a parent. That's the extreme attachment yeah. issue. Yeah, for sure. <coughs> Yeah, that's all good. Thanks for sharing. Great. All right, you guys. We're good. We're done. So tomorrow night we're going to finish the last.